So anyway, we're going to talk about uh, colposcopic biopsy, how accurate it is, et cetera. Um, none of these disclosures really involve anything that, um, that I'm talking about today, but uh, they're there for you to see uh, on some advisory boards and one speaker's bureau and the data and safety monitoring board for the Merck vaccine. So we're going to talk about um, the accuracy and controversy of colposcopic biopsy. And I want to give you first a, a short history and then talk about accuracy based on real-time colposcopy, uh, studies on added value of taking multiple biopsies, and try to come up with a lesson at the end here. So we'll talk with a, about a short history. Uh, when I was starting to train in colposcopy in the late 60s, it was really just been introduced in this country. Uh, and uh, it, it was been taught for probably the, la the next 30 years that colposcopy was very sensitive and specific and that all we needed to do was biopsy the most normal, abnormal looking area. So that could be just one biopsy. Um, but since about the start of this last uh, century, this century that we're in now, colposcopy was shown in a number of studies to not be as sensitive nor as specific as we thought, to have really a lot of inner observer variability between colposcopists. Uh, and the adage is that to take multiple biopsies, maybe even random biopsies, will help solve the situation. So we're, we're just going to look a little deeper at this. One is that what, what causes sea change in approach taking biopsies? And I think that um, whenever there's a screening program started in a country for the first time in the U.S., this was in the late 40s, so by the 60s, there was still a lot of large prevalent lesions around. Uh, we just felt like you, I mean, you could almost blindfold yourself and hit this lesion without worrying about uh, missing it. Uh, so there were large prevalent lesions. Many of you that are starting screening in your country, you're going to see a lot of these. But uh, once uh, we started looking at lower and lower grade cytology, ASCUS, uh, LCIL, uh, even CIN3 was often uh, earlier and much smaller lesions. And this is from an NCI study. Uh, but you can see here how uh, many different lesions there are here that uh, have different histologies, and yet there's only some uh, minor changes or differences between them. And so this is certainly an earlier CIN3, or at least I would expect it to be, than the one we saw on the last slide. So also beginning with the ALTS trial, which uh, was an ascus LSL triage study that started in 96, uh, there were a number of inter-observer variability studies. Most of them they, at the start were on looking at static images, digital images or photographs or, uh, or servergrams. And, uh, and, and, and a number of us, I was on the Colbosby QC committee, uh, looking at these and giving our impression and biopsy site location. And uh, it was clear that we didn't agree, at least on static pi uh, pictures, as much as we should. Uh, also, the mean age of study participants was young, and this is true for some of the other studies that uh, have been real-time colposcopy and not shown uh, as high of accuracy as we would like, such as the, the one doc, Dr. Stoller did on um, Gardasil participants. Um, so if we look at some of the inter-observer variability results uh, from the ALTS trial, you can see that um, each one of these lines is a different colposcopist that uh, that, you know, colposcopists in orange uh, called things normal very seldom, and the one in purple called it a lot, and there were, everybody else was in between. Same for low grade. There was a lot of observer, inter observer variability. When you got to high grade in cancer, uh, this started to get much more narrow in terms of inter observer variability. Now, one of the problems that I've been concerned about with a lot of these early studies that made us concerned about colposcopy is that they were static images for the most part. And this is what a servogram looks like. Uh, and this is a high-grade lesion of a servogram. And the one thing you, there's a lot of things you can't do on static images. Uh, obviously, with colposcopy, you can look at a, an ectopy or a, a lesion before acetic acid is put on, and you can see a blood vessel changes. And then once you put acetic acid on, you can see how quickly it gets white and how slowly it turns or how quickly it goes back to not being acetyl white. And uh, you can look into the canal. Uh, so there's a lot of things you can do. You can move the cervix around, et cetera. So I wanted to really focus more on accuracy based on real-time colposcopy. And if we look at a meta-analysis that Michelle Fuller Mitchell did in 1998 of studies from 1960 to 1996 on real-time colpo, she came up with a sensitivity of 85% for CIN3. But if you look at more recent studies, such as those of Bellinson and Pretorius from China, 
uh, and uh, Julia Gage from the ALTS trial, uh, you can see that the sensitivity for high-grade disease uh, was found to be uh, much lower than what Michelle Fuller Mitchell had found from these other studies. Now, more recently, uh, Mark Arman and Underwood did a meta-analysis reported uh, just uh, this last month. Uh, and the goal was to compare the accuracy of colposcopy-directed biopsy with definitive histology from an excision biopsy uh, in uh, 32 papers with 7,873 paired punch definitive histology results. And uh, for, for biopsy histology detection of CN2+, plus, uh, if the threshold was CN1, the colposcopic, uh, uh, the colposcopic impression was CN1, then the sensitivity was 91 plus percent. The specificity was pretty low. And so uh, in, in, they found in most of these that the majority of enrolled women had a mul uh, many or had punch biopsies. So there were a lot of biopsies done. Now in the four studies where excision biopsy was performed immediately after the punch biopsy and where the rate of punch positive punch biopsies were considerably lower, you can see the sensitivity dropped about 10 percent and specificity improved markedly. Um, and it was the author's conclusion that the high sensitivity observed in punch biopsy in the greater group of studies was probably the result of verification, referral, or workup bias. Still, uh, the, the range was much higher than what we had seen before uh, in the China uh, and early ALT studies. Now this is uh, more NCI da data from uh, Nick Winsensen and others, and you can see uh, that they took women that had a CIN3 biopsy, they were taking them to LEAP, they asked the uh, person doing the LEAP to, the colposcopist doing the LEAP to biopsy the most abnormal area they saw and biopsy the most normal area, and then they uh, went ahead and did the LEAP. And this is the discrepancy, and you can see uh, that for biopsy in the most abnormal area, 33% of the biopsies were either normal or CIN1. Uh, so it wasn't uh, certainly as specific as we would have liked. Biopsy in the most normal area, uh, you can see that there was 48% uh, of them were actually normal, but the rest of them had CIN, and a significant amount had actually uh, CIN2 or 3 and what was felt to be normal. Now remember, these were women already found on colposcopy to have CN3, so, uh, so they were, it was sort of a stacked deck in a way, but it, it's a pretty good uh, study. So the conclusion was even in a, in a cervix previously confirmed to have CN3, it can be challenging to identify the worst lesion on the cervix. Now, if we look at uh, Stu Massad's uh, study from ALTS, and he looked at when there was an acetyl-white lesion at baseline, what was a cumulative uh, CN23 and, and non-CN23 found over two-year follow-up. And you can see that uh, over two-year follow-up, 90% uh, of the CN2 and 94% of the CN3 had an acetyl-white lesion at uh, the original uh, 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 colposcopy. Uh, and that the rest uh, that didn't have CN23, uh, many of them were acetyl-white as well. So you could say that acetyl-whitening is very sensitive for detecting CN2+. Plus but specificity is certainly limited. And we go back to that picture we saw before, and you can see a, a number of lesions with different histologies, all that have some varying uh, minor degree changes in acetyl whitening. So let's look at studies that have shown added value of taking multiple biopsies, and this is from ALTS as well. And uh, in the blue uh, are uh, those that took, uh, that is, the, is the sensitivity for uh, CN3 plus for one biopsy, and you can see that that's divided up by nurse colposcopists, gynecologists, gynecologic fellows, and gynecologic oncologists. And if they added one biopsy, uh, it, increased the, uh, it increased the detection rate significantly, uh, no matter what the training was. So if we looked at the studies going back to China, Bellinson and Pretorius, uh, they showed that uh, of 364 women uh, with uh, CN23 plus on biopsy and satisfactory colposcopy, uh, if they just graded their, their looked at the biopsy directed to the most abnormal area or areas, uh, only 57.1% of the disease was picked up, but a random biopsy picked up another 37%. And an ECC, even in a satisfactory colposcopy, picked up 5.5%. Um, so the question is, what is a random biopsy? And uh, again, this is from NCI data, but you can look at what the colposcopist uh, chose here 
as the abnormal site. I'm sorry, there's, these aren't brighter on here, but uh, there's maybe too much light on the screen. But here you can see what was chosen as the biopsy site. Uh, this wasn't chosen as being abnormal. And then they had uh, consensus colposcopists take a look at uh, these uh, images, and that's much better. And you can see that uh, the consensus colposcopists looking at images drew other areas as being acetylwhite, and therefore the biopsy that was felt to be random wouldn't have been random in those uh, biopsy in, in, in that consensus diagnosis. So random for one person may not be random for another. Uh, in uh, the no NCI Oklahoma Succeed trial, you can see that, like the other trials, one biopsy got about 60% of the CN23+, uh, but adding a second biopsy and a third biopsy seemed to increase detection rates. A uh, fourth biopsy took it to the top, but maybe there wasn't as much of an incremental increase there. And it looked like this was across all levels of experience. If you looked at each of these columns being a different colposcopist, that there was an incremental increase with each succeeding biopsy. So I think kind of, you know, what is the lesson here? Well, uh, if we look at back at the China data again and look at if, what, if the colposcopy impression for a C, in other words, SAN3 was detected, but the culpo impression was normal, the thickness of the CIN3 was only 184 millimicrons, very thin CIN3. If the culpo impression was CIN1, 2, or 3, it was almost twice as thick of a lesion. So we're talking about thin CIN3s that colposcopy may be missing. And in one third of, uh, of the ALTS trial, um, no CIN3 remained in the leap after the biopsy, so small to be entirely removed by biopsy. And, and going all the way back to 1989, uh, Tidwell showed that um, on average, a CIN3 with invasion was, was about seven times that larger than that found without invasion. And that was in the days before they started biopsying what looked normal on colposcopy and finding CN3 on it. So obviously, uh, these lesions are maybe even variously bigger than, than that compared to those that are so thin. <laughs> So I, you know, I have to. I think we should stop at some point and say a little bit about whether the limits of colposcopy detection pushing them to that level of very small CN3s CN will have effect on future cervical cancer rates. I don't know. My fear is that going to these smaller and smaller lesions, we may end up treating a lot of lesions that might have been regressive had we not. But I think that at this point in time, we do know that taking more biopsies, you're going to pick up more lesions. And uh, you just look at this slide that uh, Walter Kinney showed yesterday, and again, there's typically a, a pretty long lead, lag time between diagnosis of SAN3 and uh, invasion where SAN3 hasn't been treated. So usually it's not an immediate thing, especially for these very thin lesions. I expect that most of these have to expand for many years over time to collect the uh, mutations that are required to make it an immortalized cell. So the lessons from Oklahoma, adding a second biopsy uh, in colposcopy uh, increases the detection of CN3 by over 20%. That is a directed biopsy towards something that looks abnormal. The increase in CN3 detection is similar for different colposcopists, independent of background and experience. And taking two or three targeted biopsies as a standard procedure seems reasonable. Uh, and at a low biopsy threshold, Random biopsies may add very little to targeted biopsies. So how do we select where to biopsy? First, biopsy the most abnormal appearing area first. And we must remember that when most abnormal appearing area generally is central and leading in towards the os. So follow that lesion in as far as you can and make sure that you get a good sample of the area where it's likely to be most abnormal. And Secondly, biopsy other areas that have positive colposcopic signs and being equal, biopsy the inferior portion, portio first, because bleeding may, if you do the anterior portion, may make it difficult to visualize the posterior, and then followed by any abnormal area anteriorly not already biopsied. Consider biopsy of a normal period quadrant, but return appears to be small, so I question that some. And ECC is typically most valuable in older women or when colposcopy is unsatisfactory, or when cytology is HSIL, or atypical glandular cells. Uh, and then finally, one of the most common causes of non-correlating colposcopy is just not seeing what's in the vagina. So always take a good look in the vagina. And uh, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>